Okay, we are on the top of Chaf Beis and Beis 22b. So we're going to back up a few lines uh, since we left off, uh, what was it, Wednesday. So where we are is the original Mishnah, our Mishnah, the Mishnah that is of the tract at Zaita. We had a statement from Rabbi Yaisi who said that there were four types of people who in the Valley of Elam, they lay waste to the world. And these four people are, right? Uh, let's go through that. The uh, fool, the, the pious fool, the one who uses his piety to the degree of being fool, right? So, yeah, there was the cunning, wicked one that was not just wicked in the classic sense doing sin, but rather uh, cunning in that, in that the person straddled the line of legality and in this way messes up, you know, ruins other people's lives with cunning. Uh, three was the woman who is celibate, who tries to be celibate. And number four was Makas Prishin, a person who behaves ascetically, uh, only ex externally behaving like a humble, pious person, you know, by public uh, self self effacing behavior publicly, but in essence is really just arrogant. So that, that's where we are right now, this fourth category, the Makas Prishin. So as I mentioned Wednesday, the word parosh has three translations, all of which are necessary to understand the Gemara going forward. Category one, which is the literal translation, parosh means an ascetic person, someone who has an ascetic lifestyle. It's called a parosh. Number two, someone who's pious. That's translation number two, which could go along with asceticism, but not necessarily, because a person can overdo asceticism and then it becomes negative, which is what the Gemara is going to discuss presently, but in theory, a certain degree of not self-indulging is certainly commensurate with righteousness. And then the third translation is the political one, which is gonna come up soon. The political one, again, is referring to uh, towards the end of the second temple period after Hanukkah, after the Chasmenoyim, especially as the Herodians take over from the Chasmenoyim, the Jewish people split into various factions. And these factions are theological as much as they are political, perhaps more political than theological. The theological arguments comes down to believing in written scripture only, or also in the oral tradition, and the very degrees of that. On the two ends of the spectrum, you have the tzedukim, those who only believe in the written tradition, in the written Torah, not in the oral tradition, not in the rabbinic interpretations, which is based on the oral tradition that goes back to Moshe Rabbeinu. So they rejected that. And there are all kinds of other fragmented groups from that, the Essenes, the Karaites, as I mentioned a little bit on Wednesday. And then there were the Purushin. The Purushin is rabbinic Judaism, the Judaism that we have inherited, our spiritual grandfathers, as it were, our spiritual ancestors, who understood the truth that Hashem's Torah comes along with the written text and the oral tradition. And politically, they understood that the future of Jewish people lies in the preservation of Torah learning. And Torah ideas, and that's going to transcend the geography of any exile that's inevitable. And thus, they were parosh, they separated themselves from the political back and forth of are you, you know, dealings with Rome, or you rebelling against Rome, right? There was a class of Jews who rebelled against Rome, the Ruyonim. Then you had the Tzedek and the Sadducees who were in bed with the Romans, cutting deals with the Romans, bribery and all that kind of corruption. And the sages came along and said, we're out. We're not involved in any of this politics. We're packing up, getting out of town. And they went to Yavna, literally went to different towns and just spent their time preserving, studying, preserving uh, Torah tradition, which ended up in the Mishnah, which was written after the second temple was destroyed already. It's during that period when this transition happens. Rabbi Yechon ben Zaka, as I mentioned, was the famous leader of the time of the people, during uh, the leader of the Purushim, during the time of uh, the destruction. And he negotiated with Vespasian to have the yeshiva spared because right, he knew, understood that to preserve Judaism, we need to have Torah, which can transcend geography. Akiva did that. Rabbi Yechelim and Zakkai. Rabbi Akiva comes a little while later. Okay. Who, also wasn't, who also spent his lifetime preserving, but he has a little bit of a different twist because he actually joined a rebellious force. Remember, he followed Bar Kokhba, thought he was Mashiach, actually, hoping to overthrow the Romans. Okay, so that's the class number, that's translation number three to Perushin is these people who were rabbinic Jew Jews, our spiritual grandfathers. 
and they were Polish, they separated themselves from the political back and forth, pro-Roman, anti-Roman, in bed with the Romans, bribing the Romans, fighting the Romans, they checked out of that whole discussion and they focused their attention on the study of Torah. And they would only uh, back a political agenda, say a king or whatnot, if that king dedicated themselves. They weren't really kings, they were really vassal kings to Rome. But, um, and Rome kept on, you know, between Agrippa the first and then the second, they, they kept on reinstalling kings depending on who was in charge in Rome, because Rome was also one of its own political people at the time. You had, um, this was uh, post the whole drama of Caesar and his, and his uh, stepson, not stepson, his adopted son who took over, what's his name? Caesar died and he was taken over by his steps, his adopted son named. Um, you know? uh, also named himself Agri Agrippa. No, Herod is in Israel, I'm talking about in Rome. Uh, anyway, all there's all I mean, this is the post the, the, the drama in Rome is also unfolding between Pompey and and Caesar and then Mark Antony and the other guy. And then Herod is, is, is chosen in favor Mark by Anthony. Mark Anthony is battling with Caesar's inheritor, his his steps, his son that he inherited for the seat in Rome. And and that drama plays out in Jerusalem also. No, Josephus is just a, she was just a Jewish historian, his historian. Anyway, I, I get the point I'm making is that depending on who was in charge in Rome, that's who they installed in, in Israel as, as their vassal king, depending on who they felt would be more, uh, who would be more um, loyal to their cause and where they thought they could get more money or whatever it was. Um, so the, the Perushan, the rabbinic scholars, the sages, are, you know, the, the authors of the, the people were quoting in the Gemara and the Mishnah, they would not get involved in politics and they would either check out and just focus on their studies and the preservation of Torah. And if they backed any king, it was because that king was himself dedicated to preserving Torah Judaism. But if that king became a Sadducee and started getting into the corruption of the Romans, he said, I'm the, 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 the rabbinic scholars kind of checked out and ignored the whole thing. Yeah, what were we saying? Augustus. Augustus, thank you. Not a guy. I kept on saying Agrippa. Agrippa was the king in Jerusalem that was installed by Augustus. Anyway, okay. Augustus, that's who it is. So there's all kinds of drama in Rome going also that's playing out in Jerusalem too. Probably amongst other provinces also where they had their, where the Rome, Rome had its competitions. Okay, so this, this, those are the three, three translations to the word production. Aesthetic lifestyle, righteousness, and then the political description of, this, of the rabbinic Jews who separated themselves from the political back and forth that was going on in Jerusalem. So now, the, having said that, the first uh, prescription is going to be using the translation parosh as those who behave ascetically in the negative sense. Okay, they distance themselves from society, but doing so uh, for the wrong reasons, um, or maybe it's, we'll call it righteousness here, but it's false righteousness, or at least uh, righteousness is a false short. So let's see. I'm going to try my best to translate these Aramaic words. Second line, second class word, called Beis Medbeis 22b. Tan Rabban and our sages taught, Mishnaic age text. Shiva Purushan Hain. There are seven types of people who are righteous, but fall short of real righteousness. The first is Paras Shechmi, the righteous one who follows the model of Shechem. Shechem being the city that Shimon and Levi massacred after they raped their sister Dina. Next is Parish Mikfi, the guy who uh, hits himself or the one who's banging himself in his righteousness. Okay? The Mars can explain what all these guys are. Number three, Parish Kizai, the bloodletting righteous one. Both of these last two ones tie into last night's year. Yeah, in the technical sense, yeah. But we're going to see it not exactly, but yes, in some sense. And we're going to explain what all these guys are in a minute. Um, okay, so the bloodletting one. Number three, so that was one, two, three. Number four is Parish Maduchya, the pestle righteous one. Pestle as in like a mortar and pestle. Okay. Number five, Parish Machevosi Vesena, the righteous one who says, what's my obligations, I'll do it. Number six, Parish Ma'ava, the righteous one out of love. And number seven, Parish Mi'ira, 
righteous one out of fear. Those are the seven categories. Now the Gemara is going to go through one by one and explain them. Number one, Pada Shechmi. Who is the righteous one who follows the model of Shechem? This is the one who behaves like Shechem. The Gemara doesn't explain what that is. So Rashi has to tell us what that means. Who is referring to the fact that the people of Shechem circumcised themselves. Right after they raped Dina. Um, so the leader there tried to negotiate a marriage with, with Yaakov. And Shimon and Levi said, no problem. You guys can marry our daughters. You guys all, all got to get circumcised. They all do. Day number three, they're weak, and they go and massacre the town. So why did they circumcise themselves, which is a form of conversion, really? Why did they do that? Not because they felt that Judaism was right, but because they wanted to marry someone. So it's for ulterior motives. So this is someone who behaves righteously, behaves uh, like a righteous Orthodox Jew, but for ulterior motives. I mentioned this on Wednesday, that guy who has his keep on and has pictures of Rebbe hanging in his store, even though he's not religious, but because he's better for business. He wants people to think that he's honest because he's wearing a kippah. Or uh, using the, the model of Shechem, some guy decides, thinks that if he becomes from, some girl will marry him. Plenty of people like that. Not plenty. It exists. It happens in the world. So that's that model. Someone who's righteous for ulterior motive. The next one is Parash Nakfi. They're not this, really righteous. Maybe they're like they try to pursue. That's right. So it's righteousness, but it's not. It's incorrect righteousness is the point. So this whole list is all people who are incorrectly righteous. But is that even righteous? Right. So that's they're why. Incorrectly righteous. Right. So that's why I said maybe the translation here is ascetic. Mm. They're behaving ascetically, but it's not. It's not real. Right. That's why it could be that translation. Because sometimes the word parash is used in the positive, positive sense. The person is a righteous person. But here it's used in the negative. So maybe maybe the right translation here is ascetic. Mm-hmm. Living this ascetic lifestyle, but it's not it's not real. Right. Maybe that's the right way to do it. Yeah. That's why I was giving you the, the different translations. Okay, so that was number number one. The person who's following the model of Shechem, ulterior motive. Number two is, sorry? Mm-hmm. Is perish nakfi. The one who is... Ascetic, we'll go with that one. Let's just use the word parosh, since we all know what it is now. The parosh, who is nakfi, who bangs himself. That's that's the translation. So, <coughs> who is that? Says Rashi, the person tries to behave exteriorly humble. How does he do so? By walking in, in a, uh, what's the word? In a exaggeratedly mod- uh, humble sense. So, the, the way a person walks and carries himself is a reflection of their level of confidence or arrogance or humility or self-effacement. It's the way people walk. And the, the, the language in the Gemara is psiagasa, like, you know, a person takes some broad steps as if he owns the world, right? And um, I'll tell you a funny story. My, um, my Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Friedman, Rabbi Sral Friedman passed away from COVID a year and a half ago at the beginning of the first wave. I mean, after he had uh, survived, um, or after he, while he was dealing with with cancer. So he, anyway, he he was one of the uh, teachers that had a great influence on me. Anyways, so I, I have one of my closest friends. I just call him Chaim. It's not his name. I call him Chaim. So one day he's walking into he's walking from the back of the study hall. It's a big big study hall. It's a huge zal, big base medrash in New York. All the Torah. It's very very massive. 200 people can sit in there, maybe more. It's a very big room. So it's like the central Chabad Yeshiva. You know? So he's walking. So my friend is walking from the back where there's a coffee room in the back, like a coffee break room. He's walking slowly, carrying his coffee and holding his Gemara, going to his seat, which is in the front. So it's before the, you know, the Seder, before the, the time for learning was started. This is three, four minutes in advance, whatever. He's walking with his coffee. He must have had his freshly, he's freshly showered. He's holding his coffee. He just had a nice breakfast. So he's kind of walking with that, uh, with that, yeah, vi- with that vibe, the self-satisfied kind of look. So it, it, I'm going to translate it in English, but he said it in Yiddish. The Rosh Shiva calls out and says, Chaim, it's not his name, but he says, Chaim, ich bin nicht deiner. I don't belong to you. What? Chaim, I don't belong to you. So my friend goes to him and says, Rabbi Friedman, what are, you, what, are you, what are you talking about? He tells him Yiddish, You're walking around as if you own the world. I want you to know you don't own me. 
got this good sense of humor in making the point of, you know, it's got to be a certain humility, even the way you carry yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So now this person takes it to this extreme because he wants everybody to know how humble he is. Yeah. So how, how does, what does he do? It says Rashi. He put, he, he walks so like humbly that he puts one heel against, the, against his toes. <laughs> so he's going to the extreme. Instead, you know, the arrogant guy is taking big strides and he's going to be humble. So he's going to make take the smallest kind of step possible. So he's putting his feet against his heel. And because of that, he's constantly, <laughs> so Rashi says, so he's constantly like um, his feet are constantly hitting stones in the ground because he never lifts his feet up. So he's constantly hitting stones. And that's why he's called the banging uh, parosh. Because mm. in his asceticism, he's constantly banging his feet into rocks. Mm. Right? If you try to be all humble, it becomes impractical and annoying. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> right? No, it's like, be humble, but don't be impractical and don't be, uh, what's the word? Don't be a nuisance. You know, this guy's become a whole nuisance. He's constantly banging his feet, but he wants everybody to see how he's banging his feet and he's hurting himself and he's all humble. This is guy number two. Okay, guy number three, Parush Kizai, the Parush, the bloodletting Parush. Who is that? That was number three. So Omar of Nachman Bar Yitzchak, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak explains, Zahamak is Dam Luxalum. This is someone who's constantly drawing blood by banging into the walls. What does that mean? So, there is this idea, again, these are all, these are all things that in, in moderation are correct, but when taken to extreme become arrogant yeah. in an attempt to be extremely pious. Mm -hmm. So there is this idea that a person should refrain from, uh, the, the halakhic term is, to gaze on a woman. Not that you're not allowed to see a woman, not to see women, you're not to look at women. But once you're not stare and gaze. So what does he do to an extreme? He's constantly walking around as if his eyes are completely shut. And because of that, he ends up bumping into the walls. Right. 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 And he wants everybody to see. He's bumping into the wall and some blood is pouring out. They say, sir, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just making sure I'm not looking at women. You know? It, 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 exactly. They're, that's right. So these are all things that in their, in, in, their, in their purest sense are perfectly fine and acceptable. But when you take them to the extreme and in a kind of foolish way in a silly way it becomes just arrogant right so it's a similar kind of thing that's right I, I, I carried her from the water yeah, to the. I carried her from the water to the shore, but you carried her from that point all the way to the mouth. Right. And you still had her. <laughs> still, exactly. Right. So it, that's right. So technically, the guy's so obsessed with the vision of women that he's walking all day long to make sure he's not seeing women. He ended up being more obsessed with it. Yes, that's a good point. It's not just that he's arrogant and everybody should know how he's not looking at women. He ends up being more obsessed with it because he's constantly walking around. No, I'm not looking at not looking at women. Right. Actually, you know this idea that a little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness, right? This is a statement. So the Alter Rebbe uses that in Tanya for this idea. Not about women per se, but when a person has, um, well, he actually doesn't mention the idea of women, but a person has a, a thought that he knows isn't correct. So how does he deal with it? So he says, don't try to fight the thought off. You do that, you're just intensifying the thought itself. Just turn the light on, think about something else. Introduce a new thought. And even if that new thought is tiny, like a small light, it will automatically get rid of the negative thought because your attention is somewhere else. Instead of obsessing over, no, I shouldn't be thinking about this. This is the wrong thing to look at. You know, it's like this guy. And you know, I don't want to look at women, so I'm going to close my eyes all day long. And instead, he's self-obsessed with women the whole time and banging into walls. And everybody's just seeing how, how pious he is. But in reality, he's just full of himself and obsessed with his own thoughts. And he ends up intensifying that. Exactly. So this is Pirush Kazai. This is the bloodletting uh, parush because he's bumping into walls. Okay, so that was number three. Number four is Pirush Madilchia, the parush who is like the pestle. The pe how do you pronounce it? Yeah. Pestle, pestle and mortar, like the pestle. So he says, says the Gemara, Amar Rabba Bar Shila, Rabba son of Shila explained, the Mishapa, the Mishpa, be Ki Madilchia. He is bent um, like a pestle. I guess the top of the pestle has a handle, it's bent. 
So he's bent like that also. So again, it's a, a similar kind of thing where there is this idea that a, a person should not walk around his head up in a kind of arrogant sense, but a person should be looking downward. Actually, the Shulchan Aruch gives an actual classification for how down you should be looking. You should be looking at such a rate where someone walking in front of you at five, six feet, you can see their feet so that you don't bump into anybody. So it's kind of like a angle downward, but not looking down like this so you don't see anybody. It's angle downward. But this guy is completely looking downward and uh, in this way, trying to be humble while just drawing attention to himself. So he's like the, the pestle because he's shaped like that. Okay, that was number four, what is it? Says the Gemara. Um, now the, the next category was parosh machai vasi vasena. The parosh who says, what's my obligations and I'll do it. The Gemara asks, hamali sahi, this is a virtue. Everybody should be asking, what's my obligations and I'll get it done. Everybody should be asking that. Isn't that not the correct attitude in life? So Ella, rather the Gemara says, the issue here is, he adds one more word. The Amar, he says, what else is my obligation and I'll do it. If a person says, what's my obligation, I'll get it done. This is the way he should be living in life. A person should constantly be asking himself, what are my obligations and I'll get them done. Perfect. But when you say, what else are my obligations and I'll get it done? That's you telling yourself, I did everything I can. I did everything already. I fulfilled everything I have to do. Tell me, what else do I have to do? <laughs> so it's adding that word else turns the whole thing around. In other words, if a person, a person's life should be about fulfilling his obligations. But this guy turned his obligations into his arrogance. Oh, what else do I have to do? As if like, my obligations, oh, of course I've taken care of all that. What else do I have to do? That word else turns, that, turns his correct attitude into a wrong attitude. Right? There's all, these all subtle lines where a person should be doing all these things, but when taken to an extreme, it's incorrect. A person shouldn't be looking at women, but walking around with your eyes closed is, is silly. A person should be walking, shouldn't be walking with a sense of arrogance, but putting your feet to your heels at the minimum is silly. And likewise, all these things. So likewise, a person should ask himself, what are my obligations? I'll get them done. But as soon as a person says, what else are my obligations? Now he's taken the very obligations and made it a source of his arrogance. Because look at me, I do everything I can. I already did everything because I'm the best. Now what else do I have to do? I'm bored. Because I did everything already. This is already the problem. Now comes the final two categories, which is parosh ba'ava, someone who is a parosh out of love, so this seems to be righteous, and parosh me'yida, a parosh out of fear, righteous out of fear. Now these seem to be positive. So why is it on the list here? Someone who's righteous out of love, righteous out of fear. So it explains Rashi, considering the context, but actually, his love and fear is not love and fear of God, but rather love and fear of reward and punishment. So this is a spiritual ulterior motive, but ulterior motive nonetheless, which is why it's on the list. So even though the others are really debased versions of arrogance and self-righteousness, this is a more sublime, more spiritual version of self-righteousness. I want the reward and I want the... And, I don't, and I'm afraid of punishment. What's the problem with this attitude? What's the real problem with this attitude? The problem, it's about me, which means ask yourself like this. In theory, if I can cut a deal with God that I do a couple of sins and don't get punished for them, will I take the deal? Well, if my motivation for not doing sin is because I'm afraid of punishment, then why not? If I can cut a deal, why not? Now, there are no deals to be cut. That's, that's the reality. Okay, so he can refrain from sin. But the fact that he would take a deal indicates that sin isn't the issue for him. Betraying God is not the problem. The problem is if God's going to strike him down. So if he cuts a deal with God, then good. When in reality, the problem with sin is you, God, don't want it. Cutting a deal, not cutting a deal. I still don't want to betray you. Right? If that's what I'm looking for. So therefore, the Gemara, but the Gemara nonetheless says, uh, so this is why it's on the list. Because at the end, it's selfish. It's motivated by the self. But the Gemara comments and says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Abayi and Rava said to the sage who taught this teaching, they said to Abayi and Rava said, you should drop these last two from your list. Your list of negative uh, Purushim, your negative righteous people, 
drop the love and fear from the list, even though they're doing it for selfish motivation. But it's more sublime. It's not so arrogant. Drop it from the list. Why? said the name of Rav. A person should always invest himself in Torah mitzvahs. Even if, even if he's doing it initially without for ulterior motive, for love, for love of, punish, of, of reward and the fear of punishment. Engage in Torah mitzvahs in that way. Why? By because literally translated. Because from acting for ulterior motive, he will end up doing it for the right reason. So therefore, it should be dropped from the list. Even though you're right, this is not the ultimate model of serving God for the sake of reward and avoiding punishment. But nonetheless, someone who does that long enough will eventually do it for the right reason also. So leave it. Don't, don't put it on the list. This is, this is what uh, Abai and Rabbi tell the sage. So this interprets and says, not just that one will lead to the other, that a person who behaves who serves God for the sake of reward and punish for, because of reward mo motivated by reward and punishment will lead later on to doing it for the right reason, which makes sense. The person engages in Torah mitzvahs enough, sees the beauty of it itself, and at one point will say, "Look, there's a God here, and the God's waiting for me, so I'll do it for that reason eventually." Because he ends up learning it so much. If it's like the other guys who are completely corrupting it and just looking around for attention and arrogance, then they're never going to find the truth in Torah mitzvahs because it's always going to be corrupted. But if it's for like you know, reward and punishment in the world to come, which is much more sublime and reward itself. What's the reward? Yeah, it's a joke I like to repeat. A fellow who doesn't like learning, he can't stand it. He does not enjoy learning. But every day he comes to learn and tells himself, I don't like learning, but I'm doing it anyway because I know this is the way to get reward. And every day he fights with himself. I don't like learning, but I'm coming because I know this is the way to get reward. Fine. Finally, the day comes, it's 120 years old. He dies, he comes up to heaven. They open up his book. And they say, wow, every single day you fought with yourself, made yourself learn, even though you don't like it. <sighs> Incredible. Okay, straight into heaven. He's all excited, he can't wait. Goes into heaven, what does he find out? Everybody's sitting and learning. <laughs> 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 the point is that what's reward? Reward is to feel a relationship with God. That's what reward is. And what's punishment? Punishment is to feel a detachment from God. It's the most, it's the most painful thing to feel a detachment from God. So even though it's true that it's a little bit of a selfish thing, but it's much more sublime. It's much more spiritual. It's got, it's got God in there. And therefore, eventually, the person will lead to discover, to discover that, the true, that the right way, the right reason to do it is for God. So this adds another layer, which is, if you look at the depth and the inside of the person who's doing it for ulterior motives, you'll find that it's the Shema that's also for the right reason. Even as consciously speaking, He's doing it because of the gain he gets, the reward, reward and the avoidance of punishment. But deep down, what's he really doing it for? For God himself, even if he's not conscious of it. And with time, that subconscious reason that he's doing it for God will come to the fore. This is how Chassid understands this line. How do they respond? Like, Sorry? Not for now, they were like, yeah, like, yeah, how do they derive that? How does Chassid get this interpretation? Yeah. From the word mitoich. The word, the translation is, from within ulterior motive comes altruism. So the word from within means from this will eventually lead to that. Or Chassidus takes it like, quite literally. From within the very ulterior motive, you will find the altruism. From that word mitoich. Yeah, which the translation could be two things. It can either mean from this will lead to that, or it could be from within this very thing, you will find the other thing. So the other trans it's, it's, it's a dual translation that this is kind of playing on. Okay, final teaching from the Gemara, and this gets us to the political historical um, statement. Uh, the, 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 the political and historical translation to the word parosh, which is the rabbinic Jews who separated themselves from the whole political game. The Gemara says like this, Amar of Nachman Bar Yitzchak. Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak says, Okay, one more statement before that, actually. Okay, you know what? I want to be able to spend more time on this next lines because there's, there's what to be said both historically and the message it entails. So we'll stop over here and we'll find out later today what the rules are and we'll know if we'll be exclusively on Zoom or if we're going to be in person. We'll find out, God willing. Hopefully today we'll find out what the laws are. And then by Monday, Monday we're, we're going to have a class Monday. It's a question of if we'll be only on the computer or if we'll be here also. 
We shall find out within the next uh, few hours. God willing. Okay, a wonderful day and a good Nair Shabbos. We should all share good news Amen. and happy news. Amen.